Well, it's getting on for towards five past two, so I'll welcome everyone. Many thanks um, to everyone for joining us today for our for our landmark chamber's webinar on the Court of Appeal decision in Finney and the Welsh Ministers and associated matters. We're obviously very happy to see so many people joining us today that the number of participants is just going through the 600 mark so welcome to everybody and i think we'll get some more as as we as we progress but i think it's time to start obviously i very much hope you'll find the presentations you're going to hear uh, informative and useful i think you will um, i'm neil king qc i'm chairing the session today and um, I, in a moment i'll hand over to our speakers um, who will speak in the following order Ben Fulbrook, uh, Richard Turney, Robert Walton QC and Sasha Blackmore. I know you've all got the, 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 um, uh, the information about what they're going to talk about and so we'll move on to that very shortly. I need to just deal with a few housekeeping points. Uh, your microphones uh, are automatically muted, so you don't have to mute them yourselves. That means we can't hear what you're saying. It would be chaos, I think, if we could. But obviously, we're, we're inviting questions, um, please. And could you submit your questions via the Q&A uh, section, which uh, should be either at the bottom, in my case, but in other cases, I think at the top of your screen. So if you go on Q&A, click on that, write your question. We will do our best to field it later on during the Q&A session, which, which we have for which we have about 20 minutes at the end. Um, if your connection is lost at any point during the webinar, would you try please to rejoin by by starting again and clicking on the original link and you should be able to get back in in that way. Um, so very briefly by way of introduction to the substance of, of what we're going to hear. Um, uh, obviously this is going to be dealt with in detail in the, in the, in the uh, uh, talks you're about to hear but as I understand Finney very briefly it decides that on an application under section 73 the description of the development or what the judge is called the operative part of the planning permission cannot be changed from the description that appeared in the parent or original planning permission but there's there's a lot more to it than that as you'll be hearing shortly i'm also informed two of our speakers appeared in the finney case and i'm told that there is an application for permission to appeal to the supreme court um awaiting determination uh so with that i shall hand on to our first speaker ben fulbrook what did the court decide ben thank you thanks very much uh neil um so i appeared on behalf of the appellants uh in finney and um so I'm going to talk you through briefly what the Court of Appeal decided um, in that case. And um, there are three elements to the presentation. A um, bit of a background to Finney and Section 73 in general. Um, there's particular facts that applied in Finney and what the Court of Appeal decided in that case. So um, and I thought it might be appropriate just to start with Section 73 itself, um, because uh, although um, uh, it's a bit early, it's, it's worth having it in the slides, um, and I'm not going to read all of that out, but particular points to note, I think, is, is subsection uh, 2, and those words, the local planning authority shall only consider, or shall consider only, the question of the conditions subject to which the planning permission should be granted. Um, that's, I think, probably the key part of section 73, insofar as it applies to Finney. Um, Moving on then to some of the background and just looking at the origins of Section 73 itself, because those play into the decision that the Court of Appeal ultimately reached. There's some helpful, there's a helpful summary contained in a case called Pi, which has um, subsequently been approved uh, by the Court of Appeal. And it explained that an issue had arisen 
in the planning context whereby the beneficiary of a planning permission um, which was granted subject to conditions that they didn't they didn't like um, had no option of just applying to amend the conditions they would have to appeal the whole planning permission and obviously that then put the whole principle of development at risk so section 73 was designed to create a mechanism whereby um, a developer could make an application for a new planning permission but with the assurance that the principle of development would be, would be maintained and they could always implement the first permission but they could then change the conditions and a, a circular was issued providing a bit of an explanation to the background um, of section uh, 73 and you, and you can see it there and you can see it's, it states that it was to provide the applicant with an alternative to appealing the, the planning permission. Um, it, it reiterates that planning authorities can consider only the conditions which the, to which the planning uh, permission ought to be subject, can't go back on their original decision. Um, and, then it, and then it sets out, which is contained in section 73, the options that are available to the planning uh, authority that they can either grant a new alternative permission um, or they can, um, uh, or indeed they can refuse it. Um, and there's a choice about which one you implement. Um, some more detail then uh, in Pi about um, other, fa other sort of um, the initial consideration of section 73 by the court, so other factors that apply, and I think Rich is going to go into some of this in a bit more detail, but um, in that case the court um, set out the fact that the planning commission comprises both the operative part and the conditions, and that they're sort of two things that are treated slightly distinctly um, when section 73 is applying. Um, an application of the section 373 is an application for planning permission um, that when it's been determined a planning authority must consider the development plan and um, any material considerations um, uh, but shall consider only the question of the conditions uh, and uh, again uh, Mr Justice Sullivan at the time said considering only the conditions a subject to which the planning permission should be granted might be or will be a more limited exercise than the consideration of a full planning application. Um, how much more limited would defend, depend obviously on the facts of the case and the extent of the amendment that um, you're, you're seeking to make. So I think the key question that a lot of people will probably be asking following Finney is what is the operative part of the planning permission? Um, essentially it, th this is, as you can see on the left of the screen, that is a sort of just an example planning permission. Essentially, it's that top bit. It's, the, it's, it's what you've been granted planning permission to develop. And, and principally, it's contained in the description of development. So in this case, this is just a random case, but it's a single story side and rear extension with new pat patio pitch roof to existing front porch um, at whatever the, the site address is. And that was the same in Finney, which as we'll see, you're looking at the description of development. That's what, that's what we're referring to broadly um, when we talk about the operative part of a planning permission but there are some interesting questions that that maybe could, could arise as a result of that and then um, usually you have a planning permission which is granted subject to conditions and that you can see in that 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 box there and the courts have discussed on various occasions a little bit about the difference between these two things and you can see that that um, quote there from Cotswold um, the grant identifies what can be done or what is permitted Whereas the conditions identify what cannot be done um, and, what is, and what is forbidden. That's a broad distinction between the two. Um, now the question that arose in Finney and that Finney decided was this one really. Can you use section 73 to grant a new planning permission with revised conditions where the effect of the revised conditions would be to contradict um, or change the operative part of the original planning permission? Um, and there are three um, high court cases uh, that preceded Finney that dealt, that sort of addressed this question to, 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 to varying degrees. But um, I'm going to take you through uh, some of those briefly to give you an idea of the background to what the Court of Appeal decided. So the first um, is a case called Arrowcroft. Um, and very briefly, you can see, I mean, that's the development there, you can see in that picture, but very briefly, a uh, planning permission was granted for um, a 40,000 seat multi-purpose arena and one food superstore and one variety superstore, um, a non-food variety superstore. And that was subject to a number of conditions. 
um, one of those was that um, that li limited the number of the type of stores that could be there. So it was limited to one food superstore and one non-food variety superstore. Um, and that was then an application was made to amend those conditions, which would have allowed um, instead of a single non-food variety store, up to six non-food variety stores to be um, uh, erected on that site. And the court in Arrowcroft found that that was uh, unlawful, that Section 73 couldn't be used to do that. And um, there are kind of two paragraphs of that decision that are material, really. Um, the first, and this is the judgment of Mr Justice Sullivan as he was, was probably the, the better known uh, paragraph in that case, and it's one that's been picked up in subsequent case laws, that um, a local planning authority can only impose different conditions on a new planning permission if they're conditions which the council could lawfully have imposed upon the original planning permission in the sense that they do not amount to a fundamental alteration of the proposal. So in, in uh, one reading of the case in Arrowcroft was that for going from one uh, superstore to six uh, was such a fundamental, uh, such a fundamental difference between that and the original proposal um, that it went outside the boundaries of what could be permitted under section 73. But then there's another paragraph of that judgment, uh, paragraph 35, um, where you can see that um, it's that last sentence there really, the variation has the effect um, that the operative part of the planning permission gives permission for one um, variety superstore um, uh, on the one hand, but, it'll, but the new planning permission by the revised conditions takes away that consent with the other. So effectively, what the court was saying is you, you, you're left with a contradiction between what the planning permission says, because it refers to one superstore, and what the new conditions say, because they would allow up to six. Um, uh, and so um, that's another basis, arguably, on which Arikor found the um, decision to be unlawful. The um, next case to consider this question was uh, the case of View Entertainment and City of York. York. And that's a case uh, which involved Mr Justice Collins. Um, uh, in terms of facts, sorry, I've, I've, skipped, I've skipped beyond the uh, picture, um, so let me just go back to that. There we go, that's the development itself. Um, another stadium development, um, an application to uh, erect a, a stadium with um, a capacity of 8,000 uh, seats and also uh, a multi-screen cinema. And then there were various conditions attached to that uh, planning permission, one of which um, talked about the capacity of the cinema, not the stadium. And an application was made under Section 73 to vary the capacity of the cinema. And Mr Justice Collins considered that and found that there was no issue uh, with that as far as Arrowcroft was concerned. And he said that he understood Arrowcroft to mean that um, it's not open to the council to vary conditions if the variation means that the grant, um, uh, and one has to therefore look at the precise terms of the grant, are themselves varied. And he, he went on to say that in that case, because the grant, which is understood to be the operative part of the planning commission, didn't refer, uh, place any limit on the number of the capacity of the cinema, that there was therefore no issue with amending that condition to increase the capacity of the cinema um, in that case. And, and you can see that, you know, he, he says, had it been uh, an application to amend the capacity of the stadium, that might have been, uh, that, that would have been different. And you can see that paragraph 17. And the not there is, if you ever come to that judgment, is I think it's now been agreed that that not shouldn't be there, it should be taken out. So otherwise it, it wouldn't make any sense. So that's why I've highlighted it in red. And then you get a case called uh, wet finishing, uh, which is a judgment of Mr. Justice Singh um, before he moved up to the Court of Appeal. Um, so I'm skipping very quickly through the PowerPoint, but that's the development there was to, I think, redevelop um, some old uh, mill and into, into housing development. And effectively, although Mr. Justice Singh didn't deal directly with this question in his judgment, the planning permission um, allowed, had allowed, the original planning permission had allowed the erection of only uh, 84 dwellings on the site, but there was 
that was subject to, to a condition. Um, an application was made to amend the condition that allowed the number of dwellings to go up to 90. Um, so you had a contradiction between the operative part of the planning permission and the condition. But uh, Mr Justice Singh nevertheless found that to be lawful. Um, and he, he held really that the only principle, the only restriction that applied to the use of Section 73 was that first criterion set out in um, uh, Arrowcroft, which is that you, you, the new development must not be a fundamental alteration when compared with the original. And it didn't matter that there was a contradiction um, between the two. So that's paragraph 33 of Arrowcroft um, that I took you through before. So those are the three cases and you can see that there is a contradiction between um, what Mr Justice Singh found in wet finishing and what Mr Justice Collins found in um, view entertainment uh, and both of them sort of rely on a slight ambiguity possibly in the Arrowcroft case so that that was the legal situation when Finney came along and the facts in Finney were really quite straightforward it, it was an application to erect two wind turbines in uh, Wales uh, and that's that's um, and then an application was made under section 73 to amend the conditions so they are that is where the wind turbines are supposed to be and here is the planning permission itself and you can see there what we would what we in that case deemed to be the uh, operative part of the planning permission which included the description of development in the proposal um, and you can see that it, that gave permission for the installation of um, uh, two wind turbines with a tip height of 100 metres and that was subject to um, a number of conditions one of which condition two was a, a very uh, standard condition um, that the development uh, had to be um, carried out in accordance with approved plans and documents and that listed uh, specific plans. An application then was made in the section 73 to amend condition two and substitute a new plan which showed turbines with a tip height of 125 metres. That was originally refused by the local planning authority but was granted on appeal uh, by the um, Welsh ministers and um, as you can see uh, as you can see there so that's just some of the background and um, in that third bullet point the uh, planning inspector uh, granted permission and at the conclusion of uh, um, report uh, she put in the following paragraph and if you're very eagle-eyed you'll see that something's missing from that paragraph and that is the height of the turbine so she removed from what looks there to be the description of development the limits on the height of the turbine and she allowed the replacement of condition of the plans in um, condition two. So um, the party's submissions in that case are quite simple. On behalf of the appellant um, we argued that uh, the inspectors the effect of the inspector's decision was either um, to amend the operative part of the planning permission um, or to impose a condition that was inconsistent with it. Um, and uh, as a result, uh, neither, neither was possible under Section 73. What the respondents argued was that there was no such limitation on the exercise of Section 73, and the only limitation was that you must not um, uh, give a permission that's fundamentally different from the uh, original one. Um, and since that argument had already been rejected in, the, in Finney at the first instance, there was no um, un unlawfulness and then there were also um, submissions made about the practical implications for developers if uh, section 73 if, if the use of section 73 was um, was limited in this way and the, the, the notion that developers would be at the mercy of what planning authorities choose to put in their planning permissions and um, so what the court decided uh, what did the court decide here we go um, well, they found in favour of the appellant. They considered that it was primarily a question of statutory interpretation and the circular that I referred you to earlier was influential in that um, and particularly the fact that the circular refers to one of the purposes of section 73 to be to be to provide relief against um, one or more of the conditions attached to the um, planning permission so that it was specifically focused on conditions and not 
on amending anything other, other than conditions. Um, and so uh, what, the, what the court found was that section 73, um, on the application of section 73, the local planning authority may only consider the question of the conditions and can choose between one of only two options, which is either to grant the same planning permission subject to different conditions or no conditions or to refuse the application altogether. And as a result, section 73 contained no power to grant a new planning permission with a different operative part from that contained in the original. And also it would be unlawful for the planning authorities to impose a new or amended condition um, which was in inconsistent with the operative part of the permission. So either way you look at it, um, the way in which um, the Finney application had been determined was unlawful. And then um, and then on the matter of, on the question of the other cases, so um, as far as Arrowcroft was concerned, the Court of Appeal agreed that section, uh, paragraphs 33 and 35 of that case were discussing different things. Um, so paragraph 33 was the fundamental alteration uh, test. Paragraph 35 was about what you do when there's a conflict between the operative part of the planning permission and the conditions, which was the issue in Finney. And then it followed that work finishing um, to the extent that it dis disagreed with that was wrongly decided. And uh, the Court of Appeal agreed and endorsed the judgment of Mr Justice Collins in view entertainment. Um, and on the question of the practical implications, the Court of Appeal did hold that it, it would not be a proper use of Section 73 for a developer to choose any old condition, say one relating to um, waste disposal, for example, apply to amend that and open the gate to Section 73 and to an amendment of the um, description of development, that that's not a proper use of Section 73 to the extent that that had been done by um, developers in the past. And um, in re response to the question of whether developers would uh, find it more, de more, more difficult to amend their planning permissions um, in future, uh, Lord Justice Lewis said that one option open to developers was Section 96A, um, but if that wasn't possible, then um, uh, he didn't see any objection to just making a fresh application. So that's where he left it. But you'll hear from some of the subsequent speakers um, what some of the options available to people might be when they find themselves in, in a situation uh, such as existed in Finney. And that's me. And I'm now going to hand over to uh, Rob, who's going to talk about alternatives to Section 73. OK, am I on? I think I'm on. It's Rob Walton here. Good afternoon to everyone. Good to have so many on the um, on the seminar. And if I can. I'm going to uh, sorry, everyone uh, I was on mute. Um, I'm going to talk about um, uh, how to uh, amend uh, uh, planning permissions. Uh, first on the grant of uh, permission, so that's the uh, LPA's power to amend the uh, description of development and uh, then by conditions. And then uh, I'm going to deal with uh, section 96A itself, talk about the interrelationship 96A and section 73, uh, a brief bit about uh, drop-in applications and then uh, a section 97 modification order point. So starting with the LPA's power to uh, amend the description of development. This is at the application stage. Section 70 tells us uh, what the authority's powers are on an application. You can see from A, they can grant permission uh, either unconditionally uh, or subject to such conditions as they uh, think fit. It's been a long time since I saw an unconditional planning permission, but uh, it, it is uh, mooted there. Or of course, under B, they can, uh, they can refuse planning permission. So there's nothing there about the LPA having a power to uh, amend the description of development. In terms of what the NPPG tells us, uh, can the authority amend the description of development? It doesn't actually answer the question uh, head on. It says before publicising and consulting, the LPA should be satisfied that the description of development is accurate uh, and the LPA shouldn't amend the description without first discussing 
any revised wording with the applicant or their agent. And in terms of uh, the issues, you can see the, um, the, the, uh, the thing that might arise. Obviously, if an application goes in, for example, it doesn't specify the unit numbers or the seat numbers in the case of a cinema or a stadium. Uh, if the authority were to add those numbers in and issue permission uh, in those terms, it would take away the ability of um, uh, the applicant to make a Section 73 application as per we've just heard through uh, as a result of the Finney ruling. And we know, of course, that the unit numbers or the seat numbers, whatever it would be, the detail would be controlled by uh, condition. So actually amending the description of the development in that way wouldn't change anything in terms of what the consent actually permitted. And so when the LPA uh, approaches um, a developer, if um, and, and suggests that the description should be changed, then unless there's an inaccuracy uh, as per the MPPG, then developers should be resisting those changes because they will be uh, doing themselves out of uh, the ability to make a Section 73 application in, uh, in due course. In terms of whether there's a power uh, actually to make that amendment uh, at all, um, I think one, one needs to see that uh, there's certainly no need uh, and therefore no justification to make the change uh, unless it's correcting an inaccuracy. Uh, and there is a strong argument in my view that uh, applicants have the right to put in an application for planning permission and to have that application determined um, seeking a consent for what they want, not uh, for something the authority might like to actually grant permission for. So then coming to the second uh, aspect of um, uh, amending schemes uh, on the grant of permission, this is using conditions uh, to do that. And, and the starting point there is uh, the Wheatcroft case. Uh, and just uh, to remind you that this is normally comes up in the context of appeals, but actually it was an, it's, a, it's a case about imposing conditions on the grant of uh, a planning permission. So it applies both at application stage and at appeal stage. And um, in terms of the facts, uh, it was uh, the application went in for 420 houses on uh, 35 acres. That was refused, went to appeal, and on appeal, a revised scheme was introduced, uh, 250 houses, so a pretty chunky reduction on 25 acres. And the Secretary of State said that uh, he was having nothing to do with that, said that it had no power to grant permission for a reduced scheme. It came to court uh, and the, the judge, uh, Mr Justice Forbes, said actually that the Secretary of State could uh, impose conditions that have um, the effect of reducing uh, the permitted development to something below that uh, for which planning permission was uh, applied for. And of course, the same principle would apply uh, to a local planning authority. But in terms of the rules that govern the use of that power, uh, it says that the power couldn't be exercised where the uh, conditional planning permission, so the permission subject to the conditions, would allow development that wasn't in substance, and that's a very important phrase, as we'll see, in substance, that which was applied for. And the main criterion, uh, the judge said, was whether the development was so changed as to deprive those who should have been consulted uh, of the opportunity of being consulted. So you can see there, there are two aspects to it, a, a substantive aspect, the change, and a procedural aspect, uh, the opportunity of consultation. Just pausing there, just to flag up that actually, as was noted in Finney, uh, Wheatcroft didn't decide on the power to enlarge the development via condition. So going from the 200 houses to the, to the 250 uh, using a condition. Um, I've seen it uh, a, a number of times on appeal, the introduction of, of amendments and the reference to the, the Wheatcroft test. Um, often uh, it's, there's no mention made in those discussions you know, in front of the appeal inspector trying to persuade them to accept amendments uh, of this case, uh, Hoban Studios, which was one I was involved in a, a couple of years back. And this was uh, John Howell sitting as a, a deputy judge. And he said that in his judgment, this conflation of the substantive and procedural constraints, so substantive was the extent of the change, procedural was the uh, consultation uh, aspects, uh, the conflation, as he called it, of the substantive and procedural constraints is flawed. It's quite possible, the judge said, uh, for a person to be deprived of an opportunity of consultation on a change, uh, which wouldn't result in a permission for development that's in substance, not that which was applied for. So slightly uh, uh, tortuous wording, if I may say so. 
but you can see the point which is you know that the developer goes in with a flatted scheme in a residential area housing all around it uh, no windows in the side elevations uh, scheme goes to appeal and on appeal uh, revised plans are introduced inserting windows into into those side elevations and you can see that the you know the neighbors you know mr and mrs jenkins would be very unhappy to see the building going up with windows in the um, side elevations overlooking their patio uh, which were introduced by way of a condition the, the scheme hasn't changed in substance at all it's exactly the same scheme but that very minor change can have very significant consequences and so what the judge is saying in the second paragraph on that slide there is um, uh, that it's a question of fairness uh, going forward so uh, in my judgment necessary to consider whether not uh, doing so so not reconsulting deprives those who are entitled to be consulted on the application of the opportunity to make any reps that given the nature and extent of the changes proposed they may have wanted to make so that's the side windows very small change but significant reps may well have been made so just pausing there the, the two key takeaway points i think are if you are uh, talking about introduction of revised uh, plans on appeal for example make sure you refer to the home and studios judgment as well and also second point stepping back from all of this um do we not need more flexibility on on, on appeal uh, because actually if you go in with a scheme and you revise it on appeal and everybody knows about it and everyone's had a chance to make whatever comments they want to make does the substance of the change really matter you know changing the bungalow to the house does it matter if everyone knows about it and everybody um, has had a chance to, to say and in these uh, uh, constrained economic times that we're going to go through now uh, extra flexibility on appeal uh, may be no bad thing so i'll come on to the next part of the talk which is amendments post permission section 96a uh, and I just set out here what is uh, uh, what Section 96A says, and it is, of course, that the authority can make a change to any planning permission if they're satisfied that the change isn't material. A uh, bit of helpful stuff in two, which in deciding whether a change is material, the LPA must have regard to the effect of the change. Well, well, I never. Uh, but then the the uh, um, slightly more nuanced point, together with any previous changes made under this section. So you know, little changes may not be significant, but in the end they might be substantive and confirmation that the power conferred uh, by 96a includes the power to make changes to a permission to impose new conditions and to remove or alter existing conditions in terms of procedure uh, it's governed by uh, article 10 uh, of the uh, 2015 order notification must be given to landowners uh, the LPA uh, must take into account any representations received as a result of that notification uh, within 14 days and there's a 28 day time limit so it's quite a quick turnaround uh, of course an extension can be agreed in writing what's the difference between 96a and section 73 well it's only available to a person with an interest in the land to which the application relates uh, it's not limited to amending conditions it, it allows non-material changes to the description of development two so that's obviously key in terms of uh, the distinction post finney there is a discretion on the part of the lpa as to the scope of consultation uh, it's not itself an application for planning permission uh, there's no statutory requirement to consider the development plan eia is unlikely given that the change uh, must be non-material to be permissible as i say 28 day turnaround the decision is issued in writing compared to section 73 where we have a, a new planning permission uh, and in terms of the legal effect it amends the existing permission it doesn't result in the grant of a new permission uh, as section 73 does uh, there's no right of appeal under section 96a uh, you'd have to go to uh, judicial review uh, and uh, that would be for example trying to persuade a court that the lpa's decision on the materiality of the change uh, was unlawful uh, and so obviously uh, good luck with that in practice a couple of examples uh, of how section 96a has been uh, considered and uh, endorsed by the court um, remedying deficient or unintelligible conditions we've got the Cornwall council case uh, back in 2016 and this was a jr uh, against uh, the grant of planning permission uh, uh, and it succeeded on the grounds that one of the conditions was unintelligible and therefore unenforceable uh, and the High Court uh, postponed the giving of final judgment to allow an application uh, to be made under Section 96A to amend the condition. So that's just a very simple example uh, of what you can use 96A uh, for. 
And the second example is the East Devon case, a little bit more complicated in terms of the facts. What happened there was that the permission was granted uh, and the development was to take place over land under the applicant's control, also under the control of some uh, piece of third party land. Uh, and they couldn't reach an agreement between them and the uh, would-be developer couldn't get control of that third party land. That made it impossible to carry out the development. So uh, rather uh, um, cleverly, uh, what they did was they used Section 96A to impose a condition uh, listing the plans that the development had to be carried out in accordance with. There wasn't one unusually on the grant of that permission. So that, but they used 96A to impose that uh, condition. And then they used Section 73 to vary the condition so the development would take place on a reduced footprint. Um, so again, a bit like uh, uh, the Bernard Wheatcroft approach, smaller sort smaller uh, site area, smaller scheme, excluding the land outside the developer's control. And the LPA upheld the LPA, so the court upheld the LPA's decision to grant the Section 73 application. Then uh, the interaction between 96A and Section 73 and uh, using uh, the example of the, the York case that I was involved in, we saw there from Ben's talk that the description of development uh, included a um, precise reference to the number of seats in the stadium. It didn't uh, tell us about the number of seats in the cinema, uh, by contrast. And so the way around this uh, would be, uh, way around the Finney problem would be to use Section 96A to change the description of the development so that it took away that reference to the number of seats and so you just got permission for a community stadium. That's fine in terms of section 96a, uh, there are no changes to uh, the condition, uh, obviously uh, you know, typically it's condition two isn't it, that requires the scheme to be built in accordance with the plan, so no change there, so the change to the description of development doesn't change what's, what, can be, what can be built, and then uh, you can use section 73 to amend uh, the conditions substituting revised plans, increasing the seat numbers of the community stadium, or indeed uh, the cinema, um, as happened in that case, from 2000 to 2400 uh, under section 73. And in terms of the process, uh, no reason in my view why you can't use a simultaneous application, uh, putting your application in under section 96A uh, and then section 73 at the same time, back to back determination by the LPA gets around uh, the Finney problem. Uh, in that way. Some authorities uh, are accepting that approach, others are not, uh, but uh, in, in my view uh, I can't see a problem with it. Then drop-in applications, uh, and this is just an example of uh, another way to amend a scheme. This is a scheme I've been involved in for a, a couple of years now. Uh, we got permission back in 2017 for the erection of 53 uh, uh, care apartments uh, and the um, a building in the bottom left of your screen, the L-shaped building, is, uh, is building four in that scheme. And then if you, uh, on the next slide, you can see uh, a revised plan. This was a, a consent uh, we've got more recently, and the terms of the uh, description of development are important. We've gone for de demolition and erection of a 70-bed care home, at, at replacing building four approved by that previous consent. And you can see from the way we've uh, put the application in, that the, uh, the care vet, that the care home is shown um, fitting with the remainder of the scheme authorised by the previous consent. And um, as I say, in terms, describes the new care home as replacing building four. Now, uh, the authority um, actually put an informative on the uh, permission, and you can see from the second paragraph there, um, three lines down, uh, therefore, approval of this application would result in two permissions, one of which couldn't be fully implemented. Um, so with that ringing in our ears, uh, we made a, um, a certificate of lawfulness application showing uh, those combined schemes put together. Uh, and that was refused. It's now at appeal. And essentially the argument we're being faced with is, is that whilst you could build out the, uh, the care home, uh, if you then built out part of the original permission, um, it would be incomplete. The two are inconsistent with the, each other, so you can't do it. And the line of authorities uh, being put forward is uh, the line of authority starting with Pilkington. And that, I, you may recall, is the, is the case where uh, the uh, landowner got permission for a, a house at one end of his, um, his plot with a garden, then got permission for uh, basically the scheme flipped, a house at the other end with a garden and came up with the idea that he might therefore be able to build two houses uh, and the court uh, perhaps not unexpectedly said uh, that wasn't right uh, and that's where the 
line of authorities about inconsistent planning permissions stems from but actually and importantly in that case uh, the court explained uh, in terms that special cases will arise where one application deliberately and expressly refers to or incorporates another and that's uh, when the authority needs to consider the application on that basis and so uh, the key point arising out of drop-ins is that uh, you need to expressly refer to the original permission and all the documentation must show how the two schemes fit together uh, and we'll see how that appeal pans out obviously in in due course section 97 modification orders these are a, a rare beast uh, they, they do occur uh, sometimes uh, a recent example is a case i was involved with down in uh, portland where we had a 1950s planning permission uh, one of those uh, old quarrying permissions uh, and i'm sure you'll have seen them but effectively the the operative part of the permission allows quarrying um, and then there are perhaps uh, you know one or two conditions uh with the effect of which really is sort of well, you know, please shut the gate on your way out N none of the modern stuff uh, that we need to see by way of environmental controls and so uh what happened in that case under um over a number of years is the authority modified the uh the consent to bring it up to uh to, to um uh, modern day standards so it's uh in terms of the key features uh the lpa has to have regard to the development plan and other material considerations it can be exercised this power w uh, at any time before the uh, building operations have been completed or the change of use has taken place it doesn't affect anything that's happened up until the date of uh, the modification and there's a compensation uh, 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 liability in terms of uh, wasted expenditure uh, jr um, it's, it's um, sort of high, high court uh, challenges by way of section 288 as necessary in terms of um, uh, extensions of time just to finish uh, up on the point and we'll finish on section 97 as well uh, you'll have seen in the planning press i'm sure the uh, consideration as to uh, whether there's a need for planning permissions to be extended uh, in this current um, uh, emergency period and that has happened in scotland uh, we've had a 12-month extension uh, inserted into the um, uh, the, the, the Scottish equivalent of, uh, of our planning act. Uh, word of warning in terms of what's being uh, touted by various uh, uh, um, interest groups, uh, extensions would have to be prospective uh, in my view, otherwise we have a problem with the effect of the grant of a fresh planning permission. And in terms of extensions of time, not possible of course as we've seen on section 73, uh, that's expressly outlawed um, uh, in section 73, you can't extend time. What about section 96a it doesn't say that you can't use 96a uh, to um, uh, extend time uh, it would be uh, very odd though i think uh, if you could simply sidestep uh, the express prohibition in section 73 by using a different provision of the same act uh, but section 97 uh, it's it's a a different process it's uh, typically authority driven uh, and so far as i'm aware there's no authority out there at the moment that says that uh, you couldn't use uh, a modification order to extend time. Right, on to Richard for where does Finney leave us? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, just uh, building on what Ben and Rob have said before me, I just thought uh, perhaps start by reflecting on what does Finney actually say? And as I see it, two rules from Finney. First of all, is in granting permission under section 73, the operative part or the description of the development cannot be amended. Uh, and then secondly, that there can't be a contradiction between the operative part and the conditions. So those are, are the sort of two rules that we get from Finney. Um, question is, how do we deal with them in practice? And uh, I think it's worth also noting what Finney does not say, given uh, the sort of instructions I've received since the Court of Appeals decision and various queries from clients. Finney does not say that you cannot effect a material change to a planning permission through Section 73. You can effect a material change to a planning permission under Section 73. And indeed, given the existence of 96A, uh, Section 73 would be entirely pointless if you couldn't effect a material change. Also, Finney doesn't say anything about the rules of interpretation of a planning permission. 
So those have remained the same and Sasha will come on to talk about Lambeth in particular and the interpretation of permissions under section 73. So um, just looking at how we might analyse uh, the problem in practice uh, and obviously Rob has identified some ways to work around section 73. Here's uh, sort of where section 73 works in light of the Court of Appeal. Um, there are some easy cases. So Finney uh, is an easy case because the Court of Appeal have told us in that case what the problem is. The operative part should have remained up to 100 metres and a condition showing a turbine at 125 metres would create an inconsistency. Uh, so in fact, the breach there was rule one, the change to the operative part, but it would have breached rule two if the description had survived and the condition had been amended in the way sought. Uh, wet finishing works, although the Court of Appeal didn't expressly say it was wrongly decided on its facts, it must have been because the permission was for 84 dwellings and the proposal there was for variation of the approved plans to allow for 90 dwellings to be constructed. And I think pretty clearly that would break the second rule in Finney. And then there are easy cases the other way, easy cases where you can say there's no Finney objection, uh, cases where the description cannot be contradicted and need not be amended by the proposed change. So for example, substituting a, condi a condition about materials where materials are not referred to at all in the description, uh, there can be no objection to section 73 being used in those circumstances. Um, Easy cases uh, you can deal with, but hard cases obviously is where the challenge lies. Uh, and the particular issues that I think cause problems from Finney are um, in the first instance where the description of the development expressly refers to plans. So for example, when it says uh, to carry out development in accordance with drawings and then lists out a number of drawings and the proposal involves a change to a plan as most um, section 73s do. The question is, does that breach rule two uh, can you properly construe the resulting permission because if the operative part cannot be amended and it refers to plan X and you wish to change to plan Y, the condition would refer to plan Y, whereas the operative part to plan X, I think potentially a problem there. Um, what if the description has already been amended, you might say unlawfully amended by an earlier section 73, particular problems might arise there. Uh, what about where the description of development expressly incorporates the application? Fairly standard wording for some authorities over many years and query whether such uh, descriptions of development mean that you must comply with the application and therefore an amendment to a plans condition, for example, would lead to an inconsistency. I think that's probably on the extreme end and you would probably argue around it, but frankly, Finney's not clear on the point. Uh, and what about a description of a development containing some wholly irrelevant information? So Lambeth is a good example. The original permission was for a DIY retail unit for Texas home care. But what if an amendment allowed uh, occupation by another provider of uh, DIY stores? So um, there are difficult cases, uh, as we're all finding. Um, the other issue that I wanted to raise about validity uh, it is, is, is this, that the question which has arisen in a number of cases, can an historic section 73 permission be relied on where it has been granted with an amended description breaching rule one, or there's an inconsistency between the description and the conditions breaching rule two. Um, and uh, that's obviously a major worry for big schemes where perhaps there have been pre-Finney section 73 changes. Um, as a matter of general principle, once you have your permission, whether granted on an application in the first instance or on an application in, under section 73, you're entitled to rely on it unless uh, it has been quashed within the, um, uh, and, and normally by proceedings within the normal time limits. Um, so that's the general principle reasserted in uh, Gerber and Wiltshire. But the validity of conditions can sometimes be challenged in later appeals and proceedings. And there are a number of cases, Newbury in the House of Lords, number of Court of Appeal cases, where that has been recognised. And to give Earthline as an example, there a condition had been imposed uh, some uh, years, I think almost a decade, before the issue about amending that condition arose on appeal. Uh, and in the Court of Appeal it was found that it, it was open to the court some 10 years later to say, well, no, the original condition was unlawful, 
therefore can be ignored and that was material to the determination of the of the planning appeal on the amendment of conditions so um, there is a risk that if uh, a section 73 permission comes to be considered in some other context for example uh, in respect of a later appeal to change the condition again that a court or an inspector may say well that condition itself was invalid in the first place um, and um, therefore my, my point there is that if a condition was imposed in breach of what i've called rule two we might need to be careful about a subsequent application which is based on its continued existence and effect so i think there is a word of caution there turning to the ppg um, the ppg says rather bluntly and has done for some time section 73 cannot be used to change the description of the development so that encompasses the first principle in Finney. It doesn't say much about contradiction by conditions of the description of development or the operative part uh, and it recognises the principle that Rob described uh, in, um, in his slides that it may be possible to effect a change to proposed development through the use of a condition. So I just want to reflect then on what might be a new approach uh, and how to deal with the Finney case. Uh, you'll see I have three bullet points. I'll start with the third. Of course, one way in which Finney might be dealt with, and we wait to see, uh, is through an appeal to the Supreme Court. We have appealed uh, and we're awaiting a decision on permission to appeal. Um, the um, uh, other approach, and Rob again touched on this, was uh, whether we can rationalise an approach to the operative part of planning permissions. The first thing is on an application form being careful not to provide too much detail. Um, the second is if the local planning authority proposed to amend the description, the PPG says they should ask the applicant before they do so. If you're asked, you should uh, uh, resist in, in my submission if you're uh, an applicant. Um, and alternatively, uh, on appeal, where inspectors often roll their sleeves up and start fiddling around with descriptions of development, should that be resisted? Uh, and finally, uh, under section 96a and of course Rob has already gone through that the possibility of making a change to a description uh, under 96a. Um, the, the approach which I think I would favour if Finney remains as is and particularly in light of Lambeth as an example of uh, a sort of series of um, disasters with descriptions of development and conditions and so on. Um, the development management procedure order or at least some guidance could start to establish the form of a planning permission at the moment we simply don't have a prescribed form of planning permission that is in universal uh, effect uh, and therefore distinguishing what is the operative part and what is not the operative part is a real challenge and um, developers of course will be tempted in light of Finney to go for the broadest possible description reflecting perhaps practice that exists some years ago of describing development as residential development of land or very broad terms. Um, there's an objection to that, of course, from public participation because people looking at uh, an application should know what it is for. But it may be that there's a way around that as well, which is to think about providing summaries of what an application comprises that won't form the operative part of the planning permission granted but will accurately describe uh, what, is, um, what is proposed. And that's an approach which is already in use, in fact, in the context of nationally significant infrastructure projects where uh, PINs produce a summary of what is involved in the application so that third parties can understand what, what it is in substance that's proposed. Um, so uh, those, I think, are the, are the ways in which we can cope with, with Finney and what it says, obviously, whether it still says uh, that if, if the Supreme Court decide to look at it uh, will be a different matter and we'll wait and see. Um, so those, are my, those are my views on this and I'll hand over to Sasha to talk about Lambeth. Thank you everyone and thank you Richard. Um, I'm going to talk about Lambeth and in particular interpreting planning permissions. Uh, this is the structure of what I'm going to be talking about. 
And uh, just to focus minds be before we get into some of the detail here, because ultimately these are skills of interpretation that can be used in a variety of contexts. And as lawyers and as planners, we should always bear that in mind and remember it. One of the key points I'm going to be making in this talk is about the importance of keeping it simple. And that applies right from the very first stage. And I've set up here the description in Finney. It's perhaps not my best example, but it's the one this presentation has been focusing on. Right at the beginning of any challenge, can you interpret your way to the solution you want? <clears throat> Can you do it constructively? Can you do it using common sense? Can you avoid problems in the first place? Richard was just talking about how with uh, the operative parts there has been a lack so far of guidance, there hasn't been much development, there's very little case law um, and there's limited practice. So that means in any case there's going to be litigation risk. If we look here at the wording of Finney, and this is to illustrate broader points of interpretation, we can see that there is scope for discussion. You can see that in any case, when you're looking at its description of development, uh, there could be in wording like this, the difference between installation and an operation phase that could get you longer. In reality, people will want to see caution about things like 25 year operation. Obviously we learned from Finney about up to hundred meters. In wind turbine cases, height, tip height has a particular meaning. And actually, if you look at the High Court judgment in Finney, you can see that there was a lot of analysis that was set out in the judgment there, as one would expect in a turbine case. But in other cases, of course, height is one of those things that's not always going to be as closely defined as you might imagine. Uh, in some cases, it will have taken it from slab levels, but not from others. Associated infrastructure, of course, is specifying some things and leaving out other things. So you can always start by looking closely at what was granted and thinking about whether you absolutely need to move to the next steps. Secondly, what... Secondly, you can also, when applying, think about what else you could do to, to uh, prevent situations from arising. Um, so to recap, Trump and Lambeth are changing approach to interpretation and implication. This was a case about Trump's golf course in Scotland. He was seeking to wriggle out of a condition which didn't have uh, an inter uh, implementation clause. Lambeth was a case about the proper construction of a consent. And I've set the consent out in the next couple of slides. And essentially that was a classic case where there'd been repeat section 73 applications. And in the section 73 application, which was the subject of challenge, the appellant's case was that uh, uh, the condition that they had meant to put on under the list of conditions hadn't been put on. And the Supreme Court in Lambeth reversed the High Court and the Court of Appeal decisions, holding that whatever the legal character of a document, the focus was to find the natural and ordinary meaning of the words used, viewed in their particular context and in light of common sense. It's always important when interpreting a document to bear in mind the older case law. And with the earlier cases of Marks and Spencers, we see a slightly different approach, separating out, interpreting what actually got agreed, focusing more closely on the actual words used. And we also see that in Arnold and Britain. In Lambeth, we see a greater focus on what the planning purpose was. And we see that being picked up uh, in other cases that follow since then. And so we have to consider what is going on when looking at interpretation principles between the planning law and other elements of ordinary interpretive law. And that shift will be important to practitioners when we're looking at particular words. Lambeth, of course, created other areas of uncertainty too, the scope of Section 73 on pre-existing conditions and pre-existing consents, and the scope for an implied term. And those are also going to create risks when looking at how uh, any particular consent is being interpreted. I said at the beginning that I would be emphasising the natural and ordinary meaning, keeping it simple. And this is one of the key areas that is developing. Um, here you have the Lambeth decision notice. Uh, 
I think all the points coming out of Lambeth are fairly self-explanatory. The key points to note that the court took a very direct and simple approach to the case law and to the ordinary reading. It sidestepped around many of the difficult issues that the Court of Appeal had grappled with. In point two and three of the various complex interpretive arguments being run, the Supreme Court said that it wasn't necessary to examine them in more detail. What you had to keep an eye on was the simple form that was correct and it wasn't necessarily assisted by being overcomplicated. It was also looking at what the consequences of Section 73 should mean by saying how everybody knew that Section 73 got misapplied and that that should be taken into account. We see in more recent cases that even when it's complicated, the courts are still emphasising that focus on ensuring that you look for the planning purpose. And one of the best cases is a relatively recent judgment of Natalie Leven, which was a rolled up hearing uh, about a certificate of lawfulness. And on the next slide, you see a summary of some of the issues that were going on. She faced a very complex set of documents, and I've set out some extracts there where there weren't easy agreements between the conditions. They had been amended over time. The documents weren't uh, neatly incorporated with each other. It required a lengthy annex, setting out the different terms and what they were defined as meaning. And what she did was she focused on what the natural and ordinary meanings would be and how they should be interpreted. Now, of course, this leaves interesting questions for any of us when looking to interpret a document with some knowledge of planning law, a little bit ambiguous where that would get drawn. And I particularly like the italicised comment, reasonable people may differ on what amounts to common sense. In my view, point two is going to be particularly key in any issue where you're looking at the interpretation. What is the planning purpose? If that's been reflected in the reasons for the condition or the documents incorporated, that will actually be easier. In other cases, it may be harder to define what it is, but once you have it, it can help give a guide to the interpretative arguments you may be able to use. Number three is obviously also interesting. It's reflecting the contractual case law. Um, one of the comments that was made to me by one of our property practitioners in Chambers was one of the most common words inserted into a commercial contract would be the operative word no, having been dropped out of the relevant sentence. Um, and one can see how that could make a significant difference in some planning cases. It is always important to understand the whole context of what is being sought. And here you have the final three points coming out, which I'll leave up for people to read, but they're all pretty self-explanatory. The judgment is good because it recognises the complexities in terms of what natural and ordinary meaning can and might mean. And of course, this is where we as lawyers, when looking at a particular operative part of a grant in the Finney context or otherwise, will be bringing skills to the table to understand how it's being interpreted. But it also, of course, raises the questions that one will be looking at. What exactly will a reasonable reader know when looking at it? The planning purpose may not always be a straightforward concept to be pulling out. Documents may not be wholly consistent. There may well be ambiguity and the tension can arise between the part and the whole. It's very easy to say it's not appropriate to focus on one sentence without seeing its context. But of course, quite often knowing the context won't necessarily give you the full answer either. If we apply those back to Finney, to whom should I send your message? If we apply those back to Finney, we can see that the tip height argument, there's nothing one could do about the interpretation. But one can see how in other cases there could well be more room for argument. And that's where going back to the earlier case law and thinking hard about what it is you're seeking to achieve and why is useful. Implication, where now? A recap from Trump as to where implication was is that the court will understandably exercise great restraint in implying terms into public documents which have criminal sanctions, but there was no principled reason for excluding implication altogether. The second point I've highlighted here is a long established point and what we see from the case law in practice is showing that great restraint, but there isn't the complete bar. In Lambeth, 
from the parties' cases were the claimant that there should be an implied term in the case, it was their ground one, the defendant secretary of state that I was acting for following Trump, that in principle there could be scope for an implied term as a matter of principle in the right case, but not in that case, and the IP, the, the underlying landowner, that there was no scope ever for an implied term in a planning condition as a matter of the statutory scheme. Lord Carnworth held that in passing, so it's obita, in agreement with Mr Lockhart Mamrie's submissions as to the limited scope of the judgments in the Trump case, because the argument being made was that all of those cases were about completing incomplete conditions, that it's difficult to envisage circumstances in which it would be appropriate to use implication for the purpose of supplying a whole new condition, as opposed to interpretation of an existing condition. But the IP's case, of course, was that there was no scope for an implied term. So what was being referenced was that earlier argument. So we know that an incomplete condition can be completed. Trump was about the lack of an implementation clause. But when is a condition incomplete? So we all know how key words can be omitted from conditions which can change the meaning of the condition. But what can be considered to reach that point? Could the description of development be incomplete? If it was completed, would that widen the description enough? I think it's going to be an unusual case that wants to test this point, but it's certainly capable. As in Lambeth, the key point will be to start with interpretation, not with implication, because quite often one can get the results you want through interpretation, which is how the case was eventually won in Lambeth. However, it's worth bearing in mind when interpreting and looking at the scope of Finney and the difficult issues in relation to section 73 and section 96A, whether or not there are easier routes to the outcome that's being sought. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Sasha, and, and indeed everybody else. Goodness me, there's an awful lot to think about there. Um, this is a question and answer session. We've received rather a vast number of questions, unsurprisingly, which I've been trying to uh, sort of sort out while others have been talking. Uh, and inevitably, we're only going to be able to uh, deal with some and not all of those questions. Um, so I'll get, I'll get going very quickly. I would, might I suggest that those of you who, in particular those of you who have asked for the panellists views about a specific set of facts, um, might, uh, well, would, would be very welcome to uh, instruct one of our panellists to, uh, to give, their, give their advice on that through our clerks in chambers. Um, otherwise, um, let, me, let me set the ball rolling with a question actually we received separately yesterday which is whether Finney applies to reserve matters approvals. Um, and I think really the qu question is really, can you apply under section 73 to amend a reserve matters approval, for example, so as to increase the number of dwellings? And when we've dealt with that, I just want to ask, ask something about section 96A as well, which is related, but who, who'd like to pick that up? Uh, I'm happy to pick that up, I think. Thanks, Ben. Yeah. Um, so I think the answer to that question broadly lies in a case called um, uh, find now, uh, Fulford Parish Council City of York 2019. Um, and what the court found in that case is sessions, they are conditions in and of themselves, and that includes conditional reserve matters approvals. So you could use section 73 to amend uh, reserve matters approval, including a condition, conditional approval. And you ought not to need to worry too much about Finney in that case, because both the reserve matters approval and any conditions to which it is subject to are with one would one assumes based on that judgment, technically all conditions of the, of the outline planning commission. So, there is no um, difficulty with contradiction between the operative part and the conditions. Um, so to paint a scenario for you, you could have an outline permission for a thousand homes, get a reserve matters approval for 300 houses, 
on a certain block, use section 73 to amend that um, reserve matters to make it provide for 350 houses. Um, that, that's fine, even though that con contradicts um, the reserve matters approval. And that's fine so long as you don't overall have more than a thousand houses and therefore go beyond um, what you've been permitted by way of the uh, actual outline planning permission. So I hope that makes sense. So section 73 can be used. You shouldn't need to worry too much about Finney when you're just looking at the reserve matters approval itself. Sorry, thank you, Ben. Does anyone want to add anything or should we go on to the next question? You want to add anything on that point? No? Okay, many thanks. A um, number of people have just gone back to this section 96A question uh, about to what extent can you use section 96A, do we think, to change the operative part of the planning permission, the description of development? If you can't do it on section 73, can you do it under section 96A? And if, and if so, to what extent? Does anyone want to give their views on that? Let's start on that. I'd just the example that's come through on one of the questions is um, picking up on the point I made by reference to the um, the view case up in York, where the um, description of development did have eight thousand uh, seats uh, as a, against the stadium, uh, and the point that's being put is, well, how, how's that taking that out? Not material, uh, and I think the. Uh, the answer to that is it's not material because it doesn't change what can be built under the uh, consent because the consent uh, still has condition two attached to it at that point. So the, the 8,000 comes out of the description development, but condition two says you still have to build in accordance with the plans and the plans show uh, the stadium. And so that's why the change isn't material. You can then use section 73 to go in and change uh, the plans uh, and all the plans that are listed under condition two and secure a change to the what is consented um, uh, uh, lawfully uh, uh, avoiding the uh, the uh, the finny trap as it were thanks rob thank you um uh just can i pick up on this then next please um it, we've been asked <laughs> what the legal implications are if there's a section 73 application made that does ask for a change in the description of the development and the local planning authority grants it is it valid uh, if it's not the subject of a judicial review challenge i think Shall I pick that out? sorry should i put that out neil yeah um i think it's it, it the answer is it is valid unless and until quashed uh, as a matter of the, the principles uh, reaffirmed in the Gerber case a couple of years ago in the Court of Appeal. Um, but there is this difficulty that the courts have repeatedly accepted that you can question the validity of a condition and um, because your section 73 application is focused on the conditions um, I think there could be issues where you come back and you rely later on the Section 73 permission and you say, look, I've got permission to do this development subject to these conditions. I now want to rely to take a step further away from the conditions I had under my Section 73. In those circumstances, applying uh, the principles um, that I referred to in my slides, I think you'd be open to someone resisting the development to say, no, that condition should never have been imposed in those terms. It's invalid. Um, and um, I think there's a real tension in the case law on that and potentially this is one of the traps that that arises from from Finney uh, along with the problems around section 96a and, and and so on that we've been talking about thanks rich very much I just could pick up a couple of sort of quite short um, similarly to quite short points now someone's asked um, uh, what what about the red line? Where does Finney leave us on the red line, if anywhere? <laughs> Can you change it on a Section seventy three application? Uh, I'm a th there's a there's a d division in thought on this. Uh, I've always understood. Some people see the red line as being sacrosanct. I'm more for the red line being like any other plan. Um, but um, there is 
the potential that you would come you come into a problem of contradicting the description of the development if you put your development somewhere else or expanded expanded the site such that the description no longer related to it but i think if you're if you're just substituting the site plan then then section 73 would allow you to do that as long as it doesn't lead to a contradiction with the description i just say absolutely agree i mean if you think about the um reduced site area um that, you know back in wheatcroft um there's no reason why you can't grant permission for a smaller part of um a, a, a smaller area of land and at that point the, the fact that there's a red line in one position versus another position doesn't really become isn't really a, a, of any great relevance um more problematic of course as richard says if you are looking to expand your development across um other parts of uh, of the countryside but again as long as it's all done procedurally what's the issue with it yeah okay thanks very much um can <laughs> can, can section 73 by use by you be used by a planning authority to include conditions that it wished it had included in the first permission but didn't well i would say the answer is yes uh, under the terms in principle yeah I mean, as long as they as long as they meet the test for planning conditions at the time that the that the application the section 73 application is determined uh, then in principle yes but obviously they well they can't cut down the scope of the original permission anyway because it's a fresh permission i mean the 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 the, the applicant would be left with either with either implementing or continuing to implement the original permission or, or implementing a new one if it didn't like the conditions it could appeal i suppose if it, if it didn't like the conditions certainly the planning authority is not restricted is it to imposing or, or to, rather to to addressing only the conditions that the applicant uh, refers to in their application no i think that's i think that's right and i think if you um if you look at some of these other cases that uh, Ben referred to some earlier cases, there were other changes to conditions uh, imposed as well. Um, what the planning authority can't do is rely on Section 73 unilaterally. It's only when there's an it has an application, if it wants to unilaterally and then permissions, it needs to look to the uh, Section 97 and so on. But, but it, it, the conditions are at large when you have an application. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Uh, and in many of the cases, there may well have been a significant passage of time, which may be one of the reasons why it's being looked at, hence why changes are being made. And there may be new policies, there may be new relevant environmental information, depending on the scale. Right, thanks very much. Just a couple of, of practical examples, see what people think about this. Um, there's planning permission for non-food retail development. Uh, and, and described as such in the in the permission, uh, and there's a permission there's a condition preventing the use of the of the building for non food retail sales. Can you vary the condition under section seventy three to allow non food sales, given that you can't change the description of the development? Sorry, I don't didn't quite understand the question that you were asking Neil it sounded a little bit like the the fact of Lambeth um, obviously you have the operative uh, wording in the condition sorry the the, the question so you've got a planning permission which has been granted for non-food retail development and there's a condition on that permission which which um, uh, prevents the use of the building that's been permitted for for non-food sales can you get round that by by applying to have the condition amended or discharged uh, without needing to change the description of the development at the same time? F following Lambeth, I, I would say no. No. Um, you're going to need uh, to change the operative wording and you're going to be needing to think about both Finney and the likelihood is you're going to need a new con A new permission. Uh, yeah. I don't know if the wording is, is as clear as being suggested in the question. Yes, I mean, so th this is a similar example, perhaps. We, we don't need to spend long on this, but someone suggested you've got a planning permission for a crash within use class D1 
and there's a condition that says you can only use it for a crash within use class D1 and you want to use the building instead as a day school which is also within class D1 but it's not a crash. Can you achieve that under section 73? You could apply to remove the the condition under section 73. If there was no condition saying use only as a crash then um, you could rely on the general principles that you can carry out the change of use uh, under uh, within, the use within, within the use class precisely yeah. yeah so it will depend on what the words are in the operative grant and whether or not it was sufficient to exclude the operation of the use classes order following the court of appeal decision in dunnard okay thank you i just want to broaden this now a bit and this, the, this is an issue that a number of people have raised in, in various different forms but but the message that a lot of people are getting from what's been said is that when you apply for planning permission in the first place you want to describe your development in as broad terms as you possibly can so as to minimize the risk of not of being shut out of section 73 as it were at a later stage um, and I mean, for example, two wind turbines, somebody's given an example, not two 25 meter wind turbines, for example, not putting in the description of development, the number of houses that you want to build. Um, is that sensible and is it compatible, do we think, with ensuring, first of all, the public sufficiently understands the nature of the development that's being proposed? And secondly, that the impacts are fully and properly assessed and is there a tension there? Who, who would like to say something about that? I mean, should, first of all, the question is, is it sensible for planning applicants to not to define their development too tightly, even, even in the case of a full planning application? Well, I can kick off, but I'm sure others will have views as well. Uh, it's, it's clearly in an applicant's interests. It's unlikely to be as strongly in the interest of the local community and the uh, authority. Um, and there's going to be a balance between the need for precision uh, in order to enable effective consultation and to accurately describe the development. And that's going to be a case specific decision. Um, I think part of the problem that one has in all of the Section 73 case law is that Section 73 applications are on a larger scale wholly underfunded for the resource that, that can go into them and that's partly why we then have these tensions. Thanks very much Sasha. Um, so, so, just jump in. Certainly the um, uh, point I was making in, in my presentation was there is that tension uh, and people have picked up in some of the comments that have come through if you're the LPA you want to go out to consult people and make sure you get the fullest views back and if people are being effectively asked to look into i don't know the plans on a simple application or a summary es in a more complicated one to find out what the scheme actually is rather than looking at that box on the top of the application form there's there's definitely a tension there uh, there is a practical way around it uh, even on the forms as they currently stand which the authority doesn't have to um it can consult on, on, a, on a summary version of the scheme that it devises itself it can grant permission uh, for the description of development as proposed as long as it's accurate but i know richard in his talk was picking up on um you know uh, more practical ways in terms of actually changing the form, changing the process. So there is that um, that summary um, box that people can actually understand what the scheme is. Prior to Finney, quite often the operative grants weren't given that much attention. For many people, when they receive the consultation form, all they look at is that paragraph at the beginning to understand what the development is on which their views are being sought. And so it does need to be accurate enough to enable effective consultation. Okay, I'm grateful for all of that. We'll just, I think we'll just do one more, which I've got down here. Um, what about time limits on section 73 permissions? What should planning authorities be doing? Uh, for example, the planning permission grants implemented the developments halfway through and more than three years after the original permission was granted, the original permission was granted and therefore beyond the implementation period, uh, an applicant makes, uh, um, the developer makes an application under section 73. What time limit condition, if any, for the implementation of the new section 73 permission 
should the planning authority impose on, on the section 73 permission? Well, if I put that up, you, because, because there's a restriction in section 73 that prevents you from extending time, uh, you can't get around that by imposing a new time limit on the section 73 permission. Uh, so you can't use this as a, as a device. The, the time limit for implementation must be the same as the original permission. That's how I uh, have always treated it. And I think, um, I think is consistent with the prohibition on extending time under section 73. Um, so you, you can't use a, a sort of speculative section 73 application to um, no. give yourself more time by amending an inconsequential condition um, and, and give yourself an extra three years. It just doesn't work, I'm afraid. No, I mean, one of the, the points that seems to be coming out from the questions I'm reading them is, is well, section 797 seems to be quite a good idea. Um, uh, if, if the planning authority and the developer both, I suppose, want the life of a permission to be extended, you, you do that under section 97. I mean, it may, it may have complications in terms of Secretary of State approval, but that is a potential route, isn't it, I think? Or we could take the Scottish approach, which is to give everyone an extra year, as I understand it. Um, oh, okay. current problems. Maybe they'll do that. All right. Um, well, it's, it's, it's properly after half past three, and so we should wind up. Um, can I, we've had, we've had nearly 60 questions, uh, and at one point, some of them overlapping, and at one point, I can't remember, but certainly six or more than six or seven hundred participants and obviously we are all hugely grateful to you for having attended I hope I mean from the questions I think you did find it useful and there are lots more things you'd like to ask I'm afraid we just haven't got time to go through everything um, I'd like to thank our speakers very much for really very if I may say so thorough and and easy to follow <laughs> presentations which people will be able to access uh, after this this webinar and ponder so um, thanks for coming. Come again soon. Bye. Bye.